Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Peter and I go way, way back. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how long. Uh, I uh, took my quote-unquote homework assignment and looked at it completely different than Peter did. Peter was looking at uh, the details of one aspect of waves. I'm going to go to the 60,000 foot level and I'm going to be talking about how we work as community together, how we uh, do uh, uh, things like AI and machine learning already, and then how we work with industry, and how, uh, what kind of options we're having. So if you want to have a discussion about the really mathematical details, we'll do that during the coffee, but uh, this is not what uh, I'm going to talk about here. And by the way, you have to be really, really careful with what you do with all these things you're modeling in the European Center or with NOAA, uh, because the question a little earlier, uh, the freakways, uh, well, what happens with the real sailors with that? Well, I've been a sailor most of my life when I grew up in the Netherlands. Uh, for about 10 years, I'll sail, sail a level 26 foot uh, wooden fog boat over the North Sea left and right. Uh, I did meet one freak wave in 10 years, three months sailing every summer. And so the, the whole idea is why do you do this work? Design criteria. <laughs> it only takes one, that one highest wave. You need to know what that one highest wave is. So designing an oil rig, it's really, really important. When you want to talk about how to do this with, uh, uh, with the day-to-day -day forecast, that becomes a social and behavioral science problem. Because when do I actually warn somebody and help them? Or when is my product so rare that if I warn for it, people are going to go like it's not going to happen anyhow. Anyhow, completely different story. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. We're going to talk about uh, our unified forecast system and particularly the way we do community modeling with that. Then uh, move to uh, the wave model uh, with that. Uh, talk a little bit about the multidisciplinary background behind that, about the community approach. I'm going to talk about some AI and machine learning, about how we interact with uh, the uh, private sector, and then looking forward, and I'll try and leave some time for Q&A. So our unified forecast system is uh, something that we uh, started developing about five, six years ago. Uh, there's a uscommunity.org website if you're more interested in that. And yes, this is a .org, not a .gov. So we really intended to do this as an organization outside of NOAA with the entire community. So what uh, started this uh, on the left top, uh, if you think about uh, NOAA's uh, responsibilities for forecasting, uh, if you compare that to the European Center, uh, have a, a global medium range model, we have about 10 times as many forecast requirements uh, through the government and 10 times as much products. Historically, we have been implementing things in operations based on solutions for a little problem. What you get then is on the top left a quilt of all kinds of weird interacting models that work with each other. Eight years ago, we reorganized our weather service. One of the key elements there is that we were going to start working from unified requirements to unified products and then much more unified way of doing modeling in general. And on the bottom side, in the middle here, is uh, there are basically six ranges of time, uh, forecast times that we're working on, one set of products for each of these ranges and try to do this with as unified as possible set of software where the different applications may activate different pieces of the software but we're trying to do that as unified as possible. So this idea is in general that we want to have a research tool and a operational tool in one. The big reason for that is that if we do research with an operational tool uh, we can get something in operations in a year. If you have a brand new tool that you want to bring into operations, it's five to seven years of work. Just because it is all, all the engineering that needs to be done behind it to make sure it always works. Uh, we've always been told by our um, stakeholders that we should do things evidence-based. We've always done that. But we are now communicating how we do that so everybody knows exactly what we do. And by the way, if academia tells us or the private industry tells us to do things evidence-based and then turns around and say, take mine, believe me, that doesn't quite work either. So you have to have the same rules everywhere. So the idea is to have a single software stack and then focus on a small number of applications because software is nice to have, but applications is something that you can measure the output for. You have, ex you have, uh, you have uh, 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 actual uh, a chance to measure how well you're doing. We're calling it a unified forecast system, not a unit Terry forecast system. This is a business model. If you let all scientists do whatever they want to do, that's a good thing to do because you need a diversity for thought. 
But if everybody builds his own tools, then there's a lot of time not so spent on building tools that you could actually do science with. And so you have to kind of find this, this balance that you have enough focus on a small set of tools that you work with. So you have a lot of critical mass on developing these tools and doing the engineering behind it, yet allow for enough diversity to have the diversity in the science that you need to make real progress. And so it's not the unitary forecast system. It's not the one model that rules all or the one rings that rules all. Yeah, one of my friends actually put the, one of the rings graphics on there for that. But um, uh, we, uh, we are believing that, that it's not a dirty word to say that you have a business model for science and engineering because that business model is really worth it. And just think of it when you're, in a, when you're in a college or when you're a professor, you have a student. Would you like your student to spend two and a half years building a tool and then starting doing the work, which I had to do when I did my PhD with WaveWatch? Or would you like to be able to pick one of our applications, have it installed in six hours, and be able to have your student to start doing work, or as a student be able to do work that is actually science and not just computer engineering? And then the impact is really that, that this is for us a really big paradigm shift, because on the one side, we are able to unify the stuff, uh, amount of work we're doing, much less models. We at one point had seven mesoscale models we were running for the atmosphere. Now we're just running one. So with the same team, with the same funding, we can do way, way more work. And not only that, we are picking up uh, improvements from the community much quicker. And it doesn't mean it's simple. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not going to be a quiz about how, what's in here, but uh, on the top, we have uh, a couple of model drivers, either for data simulation or for modeling. Uh, all the green pieces uh, show you the unified infrastructure that we have, and then you have component models for uh, the atmospheric dicor, for atmospheric physics, for ocean sea, ice waves, storm surge, aerosols and land, and we even have an ionosphere uh, model uh, in there. And if you think that this is just NOAA doing this, there are uh, seven agencies on the bottom that are working on this together, and this is just from two years ago, just a snapshot of some universities and industry partners that are all working with us on this. Uh, I'm not going to go in too much detail on this. The key here is that uh, I did an invited talk at the European Centre about five, six years ago, and uh, Roberto Buiza said to me, well, that's a lot that you want to do. Uh, we're actually no longer in the ID phase. We have our global model and our global ensemble are already 100% based on this software system. We already have started uh, doing one-way coupling of systems that we didn't couple at all before. Uh, we have had uh, four uh, releases uh, to the public completely supported, things that you can install in a matter of, uh, of uh, a day or so on uh, a pretty large range of computers. And uh, uh, this is just basically uh, moving very rapidly from something that used to be a fun idea to something that actually works. So WaveWatch, why WaveWatch? Uh, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, WaveWatch as it is one of the wave models and we're talking about uh, wavy physics here quite a bit. Uh, well, it is in there. Uh, it is one of the, f the four fully coupled components that we have in our uh, prototype coupled global system. And uh, without wanting to go to details of all the things here, it basically is set up that we can use our wave model now in every scale that we want to use it at because effectively we have this uh, unified software system now that allows us to do that pretty quickly. And the focus for most of our customers is on this uh, 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 fully coupled uh, environment, but there are still very clear uh, focus uh, areas where certain processes are more important than others. For instance, total coastal water or storm surge or whatever you want to call this. Uh, their uh, storm surge is very often not storm surge, it's very often wave driven surge. And uh, this is uh, just a practical example of something that sits in our UFS infrastructure as a fully unstructured grid, triangular grid uh, wave model. Uh, this is coupled to the ADSERC uh, depth integrated uh, storm surge model on the same triangular grid. And uh, this is uh, something that is uh, feasible for us to run in a forecast mode. Uh, we're working with uh, ocean services to get, uh, to figure out how we're exactly going to run this in operations with a resolution as small as about 200 meters on the coast or 250 meters at the coast. So, uh, one of the topics was talking about being multidisciplinary. Well, wave modeling has been very multidisciplinary from the start. Uh, this is uh, very few of the uh, bits and pieces of equations I'm showing you. So uh, 
Peter was talking about uh, particularly the, this piece, the nonlinear interaction piece with, the, with uh, the four interacting waves and the six dimensional integral in there. Uh, on the left side, you basically have, uh, so one step back further, uh, we are writing uh, these equations uh, for wind waves. There's no way that we want to try and predict uh, what the wave looks like at the, at the 10 second scale, at the 100 meter scale. There's no way you can communicate that. So all the things that we're doing with waves are statistically based. Uh, Peter was showing uh, wave number factor spectrum. That's what scientists use. Engineers, if you put it in a model, you use the wave number direction spectra, spectrum because numerically that is isotropic and uh, independent, in, you know, independent of which direction the waves go into. So it's actually a, a handier way of doing it, uh, doing it uh, from an um, engineering perspective. Well, we didn't come up with the idea of doing this with the spectrum ourselves. We stole that from some of the World War II radar work from the Bell Labs from 1944. RICE was the first one that we've been able to track down as actually being able to use uh, this kind of spectral description. Then the left side uh, is just linear propagation of ground grain circles. You know that there's something that is really, really, really easy to describe theoretically. And then you try to do that accurately on a grid in a model. That's a nasty problem to solve because everything like Gibbs oscillations and all kinds of other stuff immediately shows up. If you take a blob, you don't do this with the blob, but you try to do this very accurately with the blob, then every kind of weird behavior of any numerical scheme shows up pretty quickly. So did we try to reinvent the wheel? No. There's a lot of that work already done with dispersion and pollution modeling in the ocean, down rivers and that kind of stuff. So you take, you take what, uh, what you can, it's better to borrow something well than to invent it poorly. Then in shallow waters, we have um, uh, the idea of the fact that uh, uh, your waves uh, uh, can be focused or defocused. And uh, the techniques that we originally started using for that, we stole from the optics field. And by the way, as a Dutchman, Snell's law is written with one L. If you want to know why, there's a the, the, the original paper on Wave Watch 3 has a footnote on about why. Or we could talk, talk during, during lunch about that. And then finally, last but not least, uh, the heart of our wave models is in these nonlinear interactions, the ones that Peter described, but Peter was looking at them very specifically for the individual wave. For us, the large scale modeling you're not talking about these rapid instabilities, you're talking about the average redistribution of energy over the spectrum. And so, oh no, we didn't, just, we didn't, we didn't invent that ourselves either. We got Klaus uh, involved with that. And so we basically have all these, uh, all these things from uh, uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, the one thing that is kind of important, if you talk to forecasters here, a lot of forecasters are weather or ocean forecasters. Whether an ocean forecast you can only make, it's an initial value problem. You have to have a really good initial state guess. This is not an initial, pro initial value problem. This is a forced and damped problem. So this is how we have done really good forecasting with wave models for decades, even if we ignore data simulation completely. Still good to do data simulation because it gives you more accuracy, but it's not essential. So the community approach of this, so community in, in general. So the first wind wave models, anybody know what the first wave, the first formal wave predictions are considered to have been? D-Day. That's actually wrong because it was actually the, the landings in Africa that the first predictions were made for. Well, th those were made by uh, Swedip and Monk in 47 published that. Uh, Walter Monk uh, passed away only two years ago at the age of 101, or three years ago by now. And then in the 50s, we went to the spectral description. And by the 70s, everybody had their own wave model. Uh, the wave models assumed the spectral shape, and had input and dissipation as a function in there. They all used exactly the same tests to tune their model. And then when they were applied to real case situations, they were all over the place. So in the 80s, well, in the 70s, the John Swap experiment showed uh, that we really have to deal with these uh, four wave interactions, although it's a fourth order problem, it's the lowest order problem that actually moves 
energy uh, across wavelengths. And then the Swan book on ocean modeling in 85, uh, the community uh, compared about uh, seven or eight or so models and came to the conclusion that the difference in the models was all because of the fact that the models were not based on first principle. And so then we got the so-called third generation models where input in the spectra, dissipation in the spectra, and the nonlinear interactions moving the wave's uh, energy around to different wavelengths uh, became a, essentially a first principles based numerical model. Uh, grand old man there, uh, Gerben Komen, uh, uh, Klaus Hasselmann and Peter was one of the originators from uh, this model that uh, allowed us to come back as a global international community. And since the 80s, uh, it is really interesting if you're in the wave modeling community, unlike some other modeling communities, this, there are people with different models that don't necessarily agree with each other. I usually call Peter my best enemy. Peter and I disagree on everything if we're in a, in, a, in a meeting like this. Then we turn around and have a drink together and have dinner together. That's the way science should be, by the way. And um, this, uh, this community is really very unique in the sense that everybody comes together, everybody talks to each other, and by and large, everybody shares each other's, uh, other's results. And so uh, UNESCO, uh, through WMO and IOC, put together an official working group to get this started. That was in the working group 83, and then in the 80, late 80s, we had our first community model. And so if you ask me why I'm not using the WAM model, but I use Wave Watch, the only reason I did this because I thought that the software engineering was not uh, uh, suitable for doing research and operations with the same machine, but uh, same software, but it's really uh, the same type of model if you look at it from the 60,000 foot uh, uh, level. And so, in terms of community modeling, uh, it's kind of funny how you make decisions. Uh, I'm from a long and proud line of used car salesmen. My father and my brother and my grandpa were car dealers, had their own companies and things like that. So by the time I had my first version of Wave Watch ready, I was going like, well, do I going to do this commercially or not? And I had seen my family have their own business for a long time, and I go like, I don't want to go that way. I want to be able to play with the science and the engineering. So that was my choice to do this as freeware early on, from the beginning. And along, uh, along the line, about 10 years later, just putting it out as freeware out there was a little bit of a problem, because there were a few people that took uh, uh, a few hundred thousand lines of code, changed five lines of code, and claimed that they had written it. So we put uh, some copyrights on there and a license, and it became essentially one of the first open source uh, pieces of software in the world, uh, or in, in this world. Uh, I did not use a lesser GNU license or an Apache license because they weren't there yet. And there was only the GNU public license, which was very nasty if you were going to use that, uh, uh, because if I would use a GNU some software with a GNU license in it and I would link it to my model, it would force me to be fully open with that too. And for instance, people like the Met Office did not want to see that kind of license on Wave Watch and they wanted to use Wave Watch. The seminal thing that happened for us is we had a National Oceanic Partnership Program uh, project uh, in the, from 2008 to 2013. We specifically used that pro project to learn how to work together as a community. We wanted to work with one single piece of software and we started to import software maintenance uh, principles and software development principles by using a repository and proper ways of, uh, of working together on that. So that was a subversion repository. Uh, if you want to know more about that, there's an ocean modeling paper that we wrote about uh, all, the, all the stuff that we wanted to get from science into operations. The idea was to accelerate, to get the front end science into the operational models. That was the goal of doing that. And uh, what came out of this, this uh, as a reason why we went to the UFS later is that we've shown that when the first WaveWatch model went into operations, it took us about seven years to do that. That was a little long because it was literally from scratch from writing the software. Uh, in the middle of this project, uh, we changed all the physics in the model, we changed the numerics, and we changed uh, a whole bunch of output parameters. In the old world, that would be a brand new model, it would have taken us five to seven years by doing this in this much more community-oriented uh, uh, and um, 
professional way of software management, we could do it in 18 months now. And this idea of doing software development and operations with the same code with modern, uh, modern management of your software is the one thing that has uh, made a bigger impact than anything else that we've ever done in accelerating getting research into operations. Uh, now we are part of uh, 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 GitHub. Uh, we moved over from Subversion to GitHub. This is just a, a choice because it's uh, uh, more accessed by more people. And uh, another thing that worked very well with this is that we actually did a lot of work on training the community. And so, first of all, uh, this is uh, from late 2018. Uh, we had 2,499 users in 101 countries. And uh, you can see that it's literally all over the world. And if you wonder why we actually managed to get so many people in Australia and India and even in South America working on this, well, this is the places where we actually held week-long training courses. And so uh, it does not come for free, but believe me that it's kind of fun that if you have a piece of software that is used by pretty much everybody around the world in the field, and I spend about three, answer about three questions per year on supporting it, you know you actually have built a pretty good community to take care of itself. So one of the other topics here, artificial intelligence, machine learning, I have a uh, Three little examples here of things that we've done or can do. Number one is to use artificial intelligence to accelerate expensive parts of your model. I can skip through this a little quicker because Peter was already talking about this. Six dimensional integral over a thousand degrees of freedom is about a thousand times too expensive to use in an operational model. So we try to do this faster. Uh, we do it faster because uh, we do the interactions with a two dimensional integral uh, over a very limited number of resonant configurations, uh, which is the discrete interaction approximation. So one issue would be to do a neural network emulator for that. So you have, you basically say you go from a spectrum to a source term as a mapping problem. In order to do that, you make your spectrum non-dimensional, you, you decompose it in something like EOFs, you do the same thing with your source term, and you use a neural network to map X on Y, or to calculate Y from X. So. That works really nice if you just want to calculate the interactions. But the interactions are very sensitive to the exact shape of the spectrum. So if you put that into a wave model, it's not stable. So instead of that, what we did is we took the, essentially the, the <coughs> factor Y, which des des describes our interactions, put an inverse neural network on it and see if we could get the spectrum back from the interactions or at least the spectral co coefficients. If you do that, you can check whether or not your neural network was properly trained for that spectrum in an objective way. And if you do that, then you can choose to either use your neural network or you can choose uh, um, uh, the uh, other way. And for you who make a picture, this, the, there's a, on the next slide there's the reference. <laughs> So to, uh, to give you the idea, we had a very simple case of a one-point model, do wave growth, use that information to train a neural network, and then uh, create uh, a, um, uh, uh, an integration with the neural net. So this is, uh, in theory, like Peter was showing, the spectrum is shown, uh, wave number of frequency and direction uh, on a rectangular plot. We, as practical forecasters, we do it on, on polar plots because you immediately see where the direction is relative to the map. So uh, supposed to have, uh, after two, uh, 48 hours of integration, about a 14 meter wave height with a very nicely defined spectrum. Uh, there's a peak here, but that's about the only thing positive you can say about the neural network integration without any QC. If you allow a 20% error, then yeah, the spectrum doesn't look very clean yet, but it actually integrates stably, and you have a wave height that is within 10% of the, of the one from the exact interactions. And if you go to 10%, 5%, 2.5%, you can actually have a, a physics emulator that goes around the one big problem that you tend to have with neural network emulators, that you cannot have an emulator trained well enough with enough data to be stable. So this little trick here of having an implicit uh, QC in your neural net makes it possible to get much more neural network opportunities to accelerate models. And so um, that was the first attempt was still pretty expensive because we had to go back to the 
to the exact interactions fairly often. We had to go to a small time scale because there was a lot of noise in there. Uh, and so we could have interactively trained this further. Take, take all the, the spectra that your first neural network interaction doesn't work on, retrain the model with these spectra and go on and on and on that way. Uh, we didn't do that for practical reasons. All I want to do was if you look at uh, the fact that we really have problems in the high frequency part of the spectrum, it's a logarithmic scale, so there's very little energy there. And so you can actually, uh, following some of the theory to, used for uh, developing the DIA, you can def uh, define a filter that is uh, conservative in action energy and uh, momentum and apply that uh, to get the smooth uh, form of the spectrum there. That is something we did do use and uh, use in other parts of the model. Uh, but, uh, yeah. but effectively, we, we decided to abandon this specific one. Effectively, because uh, there was not enough of a separation in dominant scales in the problem. If there's not a separation in dominant scales, then you need an enormous amount of EOFs, an enormous amount of training material, and it does not become very, very uh, effective. Uh, if you go take a look at uh, uh, the, the, the lower reference here, that also includes an emulator for the equation of state and ocean models and an emulator for parts of the physics in a weather model. These two problems are very well defined. You have a very well defined training data set. You can get very stable neural networks. Other one, parameter optimization. Uh, so another way of doing these interactions much more accurately would be um, to uh, expand the cheap one or to reduce the complexity of the complex Exact, inter, uh, sorry, exact interactions. Gerben van Vleder did a lot of work on that. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. But there still remains an enormous gap between cost of a simplified exact interaction or a simple parameterization of it. So the DIA went to a two-dimensional integration with just one representative quadruplet configuration. You can generalize that for deep and shallow water. You can generalize that for different uh, configurations of uh, quadruplets that you, that you use for that. And so this generalized multiple uh, discrete interaction approximation is applicable in any kind of water with any number of uh, uh, representative quadruplets of any shape. Now you have to try and figure out how to optimize that. If you want to do that uh, with say 23 parameters, that would be order of 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 30th uh, uh, brute force calculations if you want to do it that way. So in comes genetic optimization. Uh, so genetic optimization, you convert your uh, unknowns into a, a, a genome. You have a population that you uh, uh, create. You calculate how fit every member of your population is. You take fit members of your population. You create offspring from them by recombination of the genome and by um, uh, mutation of the genome. Now that sounds really fun if you look at it from a mathematical perspective. It's just another way of a directed random search. But it is rather uh, powerful because it allowed us to have 20 parameters in a very nonlinear uh, problem uh, optimized with only about a million uh, 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 different, uh, different uh, configurations we tried. And just to show, uh, show how it is, the, the simplest version of this, uh, this thing uh, would be just two free parameters. So this is a, a parameter setting the, the shape of the interaction uh, on the vertical is the, the strength of it. Our this is the first uh, generation uh, of this simple problem. Uh, so randomly distributed over the, over the solution field is, uh, uh, well, the, the, or are the, uh, the members of the population, the, the, we know for this simple solution that somewhere over here is the, the best configuration. Second generation, third generation, fourth generation, you see that you're moving towards where the, the all members being really fit, but even with all members really fit, you keep sampling the area around you. So the, the power of this type of genetic optimization, other than the fact that it is a technique that you have to learn too, is um, it doesn't require a differential function. It doesn't require a well-behaved uh, cost function. There can be jumps in and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't care if there's lots of local minima or not. It, it will find its way around it. 
It's not perfect. You don't get the best solution guaranteed, but you get very close to what some of those best solutions are. And so in this specific case, I only needed about 10 or so to, to, to know that I'm exactly where I am. And uh, again, there's, uh, there's a, f a few uh, journal papers on uh, the details of that, uh, as well as the first one is a report of about 200 pages, almost 200 pages on, uh, on, uh, on uh, all the ins and outs of doing this. And then does it make an impact on real case? So this is a, artificial, uh, uh, a uh, synthetic hurricane, uh, a fixed wind field that goes to the right at a, at a fixed uh, speed. So uh, wave heights here are over 12 meters uh, and uh, the hurricane goes to the right. Uh, if we use, uh, we use uh, three different configurations that are equivalent to the old the DIA, so with one, only one uh, resonant configuration, uh, just optimized in three different ways. Then this is using three of these configurations and this is uh, using five configurations but with a completely free uh, uh, configuration of the quadruplet. And so the DIA ones actually do create roughly about a 20% errors, uh, not, not, in the, not as much in the peak of the storm, but, uh, but around the storm. If you go to three, co three uh, uh, configurations that are optimized in the integration and not in just the mapping, but in the integration itself, you get a lot better and you get rid of almost all the errors if you do this 23 parameter thing. And if you look at the important part of that, uh, the cost here, the normalized cost, the, the DIAs are pretty much the same. This three component one is about 40-50% more expensive to use, which is a very small price to pay for that big a, a reduction of errors in the model. And uh, if you look at uh, the exact interactions, you talk about them being over a factor thousand more expensive than, uh, than the original. So this is why uh, this kind of uh, artificial intelligence is very interesting too. And then the last but not least is the ensemble processing. So we are running ensemble models because we want to have an, uh, have an idea about both accuracy of our forecast and the certainty of our forecast. Uh, also, the ensemble is very uh, useful uh, to give background information on error correlations that you use in data simulation. And so traditionally, we do these ensembles. We kind of know how to do them in the atmosphere, the ocean, other places. Uh, and we just do a simple, uh, simple uh, uh, mean to get a better uh, forecast thing. If you actually use all these data, put them through a neural network with the proper observations, you can get much more information out of that. So uh, we haven't gotten that in operations yet, but there's two papers uh, on that uh, down here, one in JTEC, one in ocean modeling. Long story short, the gray, the gr so this is wind speed, wave height, and wave period, uh, bias, root mean square error, and correlation coefficient. Gray are the ensemble members. Red uh, is the arithmetic mean, so you have a, a better uh, RMS error in the, um, in the ensemble that way. Uh, the green lines are what you can get if you do a neural network processing of that. And of course you need the proper training information, but this is for us a very cheap way after we run the expensive models of getting much more information out of these models. So private sector engagement, I could talk a lot about that. Um, I just picked some examples from one company that we work with. Now, truth in advertising, I'm not saying that that's the only company I wanna work with. I'm just telling you that I didn't get five hours I get 25 minutes already over time. So the whole point is uh, the, one of the companies that uh, we work with is Sofar Ocean from San Francisco. They started off with uh, uh, doing uh, ocean observations mostly, but they're doing a lot of modeling now. Um, they have a, a nice little small uh, bas basketball sized buoy that gives uh, same kind of quality uh, wave observations, spectral wave observations than we get from the operational centers. Uh, you, can, you can see, uh, oh, there's one too much. You can see how many buoys they have out there. That's more than we have access to from the operational centers, about, an order, about two or three times more. Uh, they are doing their own wave modeling. They use the community wave model in there. Uh, they also use uh, mixed products from the European Center and others. They go pretty aggressively forward with that. They have their own 10-day forecast system that they run for their target, target users. Uh, they are one of the few people that I know of that actually successfully are uh, doing at the spectral level instead of at the integral parameter level data simulation in a wave model. So we're looking forward to see what we can, uh, can get back from them to put into our operational systems. And then uh, this is a, a little outcome from their uh, data simulation system to show you that uh, their um, um, 
changes that they put in the wave model with data simulation actually persist and move forward with, with swell fields. The problem that Peter and I have is if we do just the spectrum, you lose the information in two days. In this specific case on the Pacific, the information can be there still uh, up to about 10 days instead of two days. And then they're also looking at uh, uh, the next step of, of actually working at uh, using our UFS components to, uh, to build with us and for themselves their own uh, uh, coupled system. Uh, again, mixing and matching stuff that is available from other places. So looking forward, last slide. I talked uh, about uh, the things in blue. And if you look at uh, artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning, there's actually a little bit more there. I didn't talk about improving the uh, data simulation. There's a lot of people looking at that either to pre-process the observations or do the data simulation itself better. That's, an, uh, uh, that's a, a full, pub, full uh, presentation by itself. Uh, one of the things we haven't really done that much yet is to try to get more understanding of the physics by doing machine learning on observational data. But also you could do machine learning on our models because our models, because of this highly nonlinear internal driving engine, it's not so clear to me that we actually understand what our models actually do internally, although we have parameterizations inside there. And then the last but not least, there are those who say that uh, AI should replace these very expensive models that we have. And if you want to learn more about that, there is a TED talk I did two years ago about a little bit more about specifically if AI can replace things. So, uh, well, we have time for maybe a couple of short questions. Uh, well, it's just a comment on your statement that ensemble averages were more accurate. I, I think this is a very misleading uh, statement because for an ensemble. Sorry? For outlook problems. For what? For, for beyond two weeks. Well, before any time, doesn't really matter. The point about an ensemble average is it damps any extremes of weather. So if your metric of accuracy is extreme weather, then an ensemble average isn't more accurate. It's yeah, only I'm more accurate in an I'm RMS sense, agree. and that doesn't necessarily correspond to what users, like freak waves and mm -hmm. things, want. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Uh, you have to be very careful how you do that. Uh, and you have to also be careful of the fact that uh, uh, a lot of our metrics by nature uh, tend to favor smooth models without the details and that is specifically important of course for us in the forecast business because we don't care that much about doing the average weather right, we care about the extremes and so you have to be absolutely absolutely clear with that and unfortunately I, that's a, another full talk. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, how the the community model is connected to the code that runs uh, daily in operation? So, uh, if I heard you correctly, how is the code? Uh, is it the same code that you can find in the repositories? Uh, yes, our, uh, for the record, you could always find these codes in a repository as a tarball without documentation and only working on our hardware. Uh, with uh, the, the code releases that we've done for our global model and for our medium range model. Uh, so our, sorry, our, uh, our global model, the GFS v, uh, version 17 code is 99% uh, the same as the last release of the weather model that we've made to the public. And so that is a code that now comes with all the libraries that you need uh, with uh, full documentation and with instructions how to, how to uh, install that pretty much everywhere. And so uh, our big uh, step forward uh, about two years ago is when we did that first release of that code. And so to be precise, it's only the forecast model. The data simulation part is not there yet. So yeah, we provide initial conditions and, uh, and tools to change that to other resolutions if you want them. Uh, we will move to have the whole system out there, but that will take a little bit more. But um, about 10 years ago, Neil Jacobs uh, at Panasonic uh, wanted, to ha wanted to run our model. Uh, he had a, a group of about three or four people that worked about a year for a year on that, and they had bought the same hardware we had to do that. So that was a 10 to $12 million investment to get the code running once. And so one of the things we did with our first code release 
is to set up what we call the graduate student test. We had a relatively low resolution coupled uh, ocean atmosphere ice model uh, that uh, we completely cleaned up, uh, had all the, all, the, all the libraries cleaned up and set up in such a way that you should be able to install that on uh, about five or six target machines that we had from NOAA and from the National Science Foundation or on a Mac. And the goal was to be able to install that, uh, change uh, something in the ocean model, or install it, run it, change something in the ocean model, run it again, look at the differences in six hours. And Neil Jacobs took a nine-year-old MacBook Pro. He spent quite a bit of time on reinstalling an operating system and, and compilers on that. That took him a day or two. And then he was able to get that to run on his MacBook in under six hours. And so these are some of those engineering things that when you live, live in the science world, you not always think about. But those are some of, the engineer, some of the engineering things that really drive the utility of this kind of software and drive uh, the, the potential of building a large community with this. So the idea of us is to be able to have a student start doing research in the first week of their project. And that means that they have to be able to get the software up and running in the first day. And uh, if you look at that um, in the AMS meeting that was associated with this first release in uh, Boston in 2020, we already had like 75 papers on this system presented on the on the AMS. And we were just looking at uh, just the community modeling uh, a conference, the second annual community modeling conference that we have on uh, AMS uh, uh, in January. Uh, we had, uh, just for that one piece of conference, we already had uh, uh, something like 85 abstracts for that. So, so it's kind of obvious from, from that kind of metrics that this is kind of working. Uh, so, uh, do you have um, some machine learning running in operation? Uh, not yet. Uh, we uh, we are uh, hoping that uh, uh, in the next not not well. We have a uh, a new uh, GFS implementation coming in hopefully in a month or so. I don't know the exact date, but we are in the final testing. Uh, that doesn't have it in there. We hope that the next one or the one after that will have at least some of the. Uh, neural network uh, uh, post-processing in place. Having said that, uh, that optimization that I showed that we did uh, with the generalized uh, uh, interaction approximation, uh, the results of that are in operations, but the, the, the AI part of that is, is to get there. It's not the, the end product. Thank you very much. Let's take our speaker again. <laughs> and we have a tea break and well when we return it's quarter to yeah quarter to noon yeah. sorry for those who ask questions online we've got a discussion discussion and question session at the end so I'll I'll take those questions then for Hendrik um, we are, we are timetabled in for a 20 minute break but let's try and make it 15 minutes if we can come back we'll run about five ten minutes behind but catch up eventually Thank you.